Steppin' Out is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. It happens here each week. We step out and enjoy our region's events and rich culture. We are proud to support WIES. Roll, Roll camera. camera. The American Italian Cultural Center and Museum on South Peters in New Orleans offers event venue space, Italian language classes, dual citizenship and translation services, seminars, genealogy, and trips to Italy. Ciao, AmericanItalianCulturalCenter.com. This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area. I'm Peggy Scott Laborde, and welcome to Steppin' Out. Joining me for a very special edition, Richard Campanella, the author of 14 books pertaining to the history, cityscape, and overall geography of New Orleans. Richard has been with Tulane University for over two decades and is currently geographer and an associate dean for research for the Tulane School of Architecture. So much to talk about, Richard. First of all, let us start kind of sort of at the beginning. Obviously, you clearly love New Orleans. How do we come to be here and New Orleans come to be located in the very spot that we're in? Well, um, there's a short answer and a long answer. Uh, the short answer was a, uh, a back swamp portage that allowed colonials and indigenous before them uh, to, instead of fighting the current and shoals and sandbars coming up the Mississippi, which was very difficult in the early 1700s, to come in um, through uh, Mississippi Sound, Lake Bourne, through the Wrigley's into Lake Pontchartrain. So train. a path, when you say portage. A portage, um, I'm getting to that. Okay. Uh, uh, through Lake Pontchartrain, up Bayou St. John, until it petered out, disembark, and then take a two-mile long, very slight ridge connecting Bayou St. John to the natural levee of the Mississippi. And the French called it portage, portage meaning to carry. So you would carry your pirogue or your canoe or your cargo, <laughs> and you could connect, essentially, New or future New Orleans foreland and its hinterland. Okay. Now there is a much longer story to <laughs> right, that. Right. You're giving me the, uh, but, the quickie uh, version. It, it was highly disputed uh -huh. by French colonials for the better part of 20 years as to where to put the most important uh, office and and essentially the capital of the Louisiana colony. Should it be on the coast? Should it be on in, in the interior? And so what Bienville did, I think, to his credit, he was he found the what I call the least dirty shirt in the laundry, okay? <laughs> the least lousy site within a fantastic situation for a city. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, of course, you know, Iberville does the exploration with his little brother, Bienville. Uh, 1699. They are, they are of Canadian um, parentage, but of course, ultimately, they're doing this for France. So Bienville's the one, though, who gets to stick around, and he's very, very important to the city in so many ways. But one thing, fairly early on, when he's still kind of a humble soldier in terms of what I think of as the big bluff. Right. Uh, the year 1699, Iberville, Bienville, and their crew in three ships refined the Mississippi that La Salle had found uh, 17 years earlier. Uh, this is in March, April of 1699. And over the next few months, uh, Iberville goes up and he does his, his exploration. And Bienville, who's only 19 at this time, one day, <laughs> September 15, 1699, is rowing two long boats around a certain bend in the Mississippi. They see on the horizon the very thing they feared the most, which was uh, a fully rigged uh, English ship um, uh, by the name of the Carolina Galley, captained by Lewis Bond. And what it was, was a man by the name of Daniel Cox, uh, who was a doctor in London, who sight unseen secured a, a land patent, a land grant, covering from Carolina, Today's North and South Carolina, <laughs> all the way over to the Pacific Ocean. Oh, my goodness. And so what he wanted to do was to secure this part of Carolina before the French did, uh, and the Spanish also had an eye on it. So Cox had sent Louis Bond to secure this because they heard rumors of Iberville trying to do the same. And incredibly, 
of all the thousands of miles out there, Bienville meets Bond right on the river. And even more incredibly, they knew each other. Iberville had previously captured Bond when they were in war on the Hudson Bay. And Bienville used that to his advantage and convinced Bond that Iberville was just upriver and that this was a French uh, uh, colony. And so Bond turned around and sailed back to Charleston. And to, to this day, we call that bend English Turn. <laughs> It's an incredible story. But it was story. the big bluff. Right? It was an incredible bluff. And the, the English there got to the point of actually landing. And according to Cox, they naturally nailed some boards with the English coat of arms <laughs> oh. on these trees in what Iberville insisted was French Louisiana. So had they missed, remember, this is an armed ship, had they missed there is a good chance that the English could have gotten a head start in establishing here, and who knows how the, very, the contingencies of history might so have played out. Yeah. My brother's just around the corner, and he's, you know, very yeah. well stocked. He, he was a lordly, <laughs> he's a tough read, Bienville. I often think about him and have conversations with him. He was, he was a 19-year-old, very lordly, and, and uh, you know, very, very serious. Um, he's, he's taciturn, humorless, uh, but, but diligent. Mm. And of course, 1718 is the official none no, of is the official founding uh, of the city. Um, but he lives to his 80s, and eventually he leaves uh, New Orleans. He does. Uh, he lives just long enough to hear that the French have ceded the uh, colony over to the Spanish. In fact, there was a contingent of of distressed French Creoles who actually traveled to Paris to try to recruit him to change the mind of the French. Uh, and uh, and as you know, and also the year that he, right around the time he died, was the rebellion of 1768 of these highly displeased French uh, Creoles who didn't want the Spanish coming in. Five of them were executed, and thus Frenchman Street. So Spanish back to France, and then of course back to France, uh, America. The twisting of the arm by Napoleon, <laughs> and uh, yeah. Well, as we mentioned at the beginning, 14 books, and once again, congratulations. But one of them is called Bienville's Dilemma. And this is a compilation of um, articles that you had done and essays over the years. But you talk specifically about what we've just said. Right. right. Th this dilemma yeah. of site versus situation. Um, what is the best location for a city? Uh, is, this, is it the safest site or is it the most strategic situation? Mm. Bienville chose the latter. Yeah. Wow. And speaking of being on the river, we've got another river story. We're going to jump ahead chronologically here, though. But... The young Abe Lincoln on one of those flatboats. Tell us about his situation then and what he sees. 1828, he's um, uh, also 19 years old uh, and coming out of Rockport, uh, Rockport, Indiana, where he came of age as a young man. And in those days uh, on the Western Rivers, when you came of age, you proved your nettle and, and your responsibility by building a flatboat yourself or with another farmhand and uh, taking your family's produce down to the one place where you could exchange it for hard currency and come back on a steamboat. So as extraordinary as he became later in life, he was one of thousands of these young, some were from Kentucky, some from Ohio, um, and who came down the river, um, you know, dodging uh, planters, mm. you know, these, these uh, trunks bobbing up and down. And he was actually violently attacked in Louisiana to the point of almost losing his life. Uh, by my best estimates, it was around Convent, Louisiana. And the next morning, the next day or so, he pulled into New Orleans. He probably docked, by my best estimations, you know where the Market Street power plant is. Mm -hmm. The river, the Batcher has since graded there. And it's, mm -hmm. so the riverfront is, is further in the river now. But at the time, I would put it roughly along South Peters by the Market Street power plant is where the flatboat wharf was, and he probably left. So they had down. docked for the night in, around, as you said, Convent, Louisiana, and so marauders Correct. came and attacked? Seven of them, uh, and mm. uh, it was a decision left up to flatboatmen whether they wanted to continue to travel at night. Dangerous. It was dangerous. Uh, if you had a full moon, you could do it, and you could really build up your speed. Uh, you were protected from the sun and elements. Usually they tied up for the night. They're completely vulnerable out there. They're isolated, mm. and sure enough, they were attacked. 
And uh, so almost, yeah, almost lost his life. And then when he comes to New Orleans, is he seeing an enslaved people for the first time? Certainly he is. He never leaves a journal. And uh, as modest as he was, uh, he, ne he rarely spoke in, even his autobiography is in the third person. <laughs> And so he, uh, there's a number of times when he did make mention of it. Some of my best sources were the people who remembered him from his childhood were, who were interviewed by Billy Herndon, his law partner, in 1865, right after the assassination. And they had many memories of him talking about his trip and the various influences uh, uh, that, that it had upon him. Wow. Re researching that book was one of the most amazing experiences I ever had. Going up there to, uh, I found the grave of the, the, the young man who came with him, Alan Gentry, uh, and interviewed his direct descendants. Mm. It was really neat. Mm. Well, we're going to jump uh, a, a much uh, more ahead and talk about of all the books uh, that you've written, I have to tell you one of the most surprising ones was A History of Bourbon Street. Actually, it's not surprising, because no. if, if you do a close read of it, you could see it's a geography, and that is the unifying perspective of all of my books. I'm a historical geographer, so I, I think about space, I analyze spatial relationships, and it's really the history of Bourbon Street is the story of how as opposed to all of these other streets, did this one strip of about 5,000 feet emerge into this infamous, famous, notorious, <laughs> beloved, hated place that is that elicits all sorts of uh, feelings? <laughs> so it's it's really a, a spatial analysis of how this street came to be so exceptional. You know, I think especially folks who you know um, who are younger and don't remember World War II. I mean, I, I mean, of course I don't. But but the how what an influx uh, be, between the Higgins plant and also this was a, po a point of uh, embarkation and debarkation. And so a lot of sailors are coming through town yeah. and they're looking for a good. They're time. looking for a good time, and, and it's, it's in addition hundreds of thousands went out to the port of embarkation into the Caribbean and, and the, uh, the Pacific theater, but millions came by at, at, on R&R &R from, uh, from, uh, yeah, from uh, boot camps throughout the South. Ah. Uh, and, and then they went back, uh -huh. it, back to the boot camp or back. And so that increased the population even more. Uh, and so there, you know, you could imagine they have a world of worries on their mind, complete unknown in their own personal futures. Mm -hmm. What do they want? Escapism. What does Bourbon Street sell? <laughs> Escapism. They're yes. very good Exotic at it. Exotic dancers make some. That's the least say of it. strippers, <laughs> right? That's exactly a little burlesque there too. Um, um, some original spots in the city. Where was the original riverfront uh, in terms of if you're in the quarter today? What was the original riverfront? The good question. It it was. Um, only a few dozen feet riverside of what is now North Peters. And wow. when you continue North Peters and it becomes Chapatula Street, Chapatula was the circa 1718 riverfront for most wow. of what is now downtown mm -hmm. New Orleans. And what Goodness. started to form there later in the uh, 18th and into the 19th century, the river shifted channels a little bit. It ran slack on this side. It's called the Point Bar. It lost its kinetic energy and started dumping out its sediment, and a batcher formed. Hmm. And once the batcher formed, city and property owners eagerly moved the levee out to capture it. And that explains why where Lincoln landed is not on the river today. It's far inland. Uh, that batcher kept aggrading and pushing the land out. Okay. On the West Bank, it was the exact opposite, because the West Bank is on the Cutbank side, and the river scoured away. So places like McDonough's original plantation home, all gone. The They're in the uh -huh. river now. So everything the East Bank gained, particularly the warehouse district, looks straight across to Algiers. Algiers lost the same amount. She was. Now let's talk about the lakefront, because I think so many people, especially those who live in Lake Vista, have no idea <laughs> how different this was not too long ago. They'd be in Tell the water. us about that. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, 1926 and 1934, one of the most uh, amazing projects, geographic modifications in New Orleans history where the Orleans Parish Levy Board and state authorities uh, dredged sediment from the bottom of Lake Pontchartrain, built a coffer dam about essentially a levee a off the coffer, uh, coffer dam. Okay. Uh, just think um, a barrier extending off the natural lake shore. Okay? Um, you dig sediment on the lake side, 
pump it in there through a slurry. You make a, you know, like a muddy mix out of it. Pump it in, drain out the water, pump it in, drain out the water, and you build up land. And it's called reclamation. And so everything, all those lake-named neighborhoods is uh, five feet above sea level now. Very successful project. Uh, and uh, as you know, it was the only part of that the city that didn't flood during Katrina. And how long did that take? Um, most of it took about three or four years. That's what cool. extended it to 1934 was the addition of Lakefront Airport, which of course is also reclaimed. And all you have to do is look at the at the bite, uh, the, the smooth southern shore of Lake Pontchartrain, and you could see how unnatural it looks for the lakefront and lake and the the airport to stick out um, it was originally motivated people think it was to create new residential and parkland the original motivation was flood protection because mm. uh, at the time this is in the years after the great storm of 1915 the back swamp is drained lakeview and gentilly are under development they flooded after the 1915 form uh, and they're also sinking below sea level now that we drain them. So as a, to create a barricade of high ground, the lakefront project came out of that. So what, so what would have been the original boundary? What street? Where, what, was the, what was the actual border? Uh, of, of, of the lake, yeah. where the lake shore yeah. is? Leon C. Simon and what used to be uh, Robert, Robert E. Lee. Lee right, and now right. Alan C. Uh, right, That's right. really far right. back. Right, That's right. Amazing. It's, about, it's about a half a mile. Uh, and uh -huh. it, was, um, it was a soft saline marsh shore. The lake, of course, is brackish, so wherever the tidal regime was, it tended to stunt vegetation growth. That's why we have little woods, petit bois, uh, because the saline waters stunted mm -hmm. the tree growth. So it would have been a soft, marshy shore, uh, and then by the time the development comes, the levee came up, and then the reclamation project. Well, the last few years, you have been extra, extra busy with two big books, okay, and uh, one of them on the West Bank, about the development of the West Bank, which in, in reading uh, uh, that, uh, you know, talking about, we're, when we say West Bank, we're talking about a geographical proximity, but it was really for, to go west. To head west. It was, west we go. It, you know, it's it's so um, apparent that sometimes we forget <laughs> that the West Bank is terrestrially connected to the western frontier. Huh. And that is what made it a railroad hub. And that is what made it um, kind of the Fort Worth of Louisiana, stockyards. It was the jumping off point. When we think of the jumping off point into western frontier, we think of Omaha, maybe St. Louis. But in the southern tier of the western frontier, it was the West Bank. You had to go, <laughs> you had to take a ferry to a station in Algiers to take a railroad uh, to, to, to the Pacific coast of the late 19th century. Uh, and so it had industry. It was uh, the Birmingham. It was the Atlanta. It was the Pullman uh, of, of the region. Uh, and we often beat ourselves up for not having done what St. Louis and other Midwestern cities do in terms of manufacturing and industry. The West Bank did all those things. <laughs> they had the land. They had the space. They had the railroads. Uh, and so it's, but nobody ever writes about it. You know, yeah. It's pretty much the only book about the West Bank of New Orleans. Now, there's one for Algiers, there's one for us, West Wego, mm -hmm. uh, but as a cohesive unit, um, it gets neglected. And um, there was, of course, for so many years, talk of trying to build a bridge. You know, it finally happens yeah. initially with UEP Long, but not quite, a little further uh, down in Jefferson Parish. But uh, there were a lot of efforts doing that, and also draining, your next book is Draining New Orleans, and they kind of, in a, in a way, uh, come together very nicely the West Bank book in Draining New Orleans in the form of a gentleman named George Hero. George Hero, who you introduced me to a number his of years ago. We believe yes, his grandson. Yes. Huh? His, yes. his uh -huh. uh, grandson is in his 90s now. Um, George Hero is uh, the, the, the patriarch, uh, born in the early 1850s, remarkable man, uh, made a fortune in the cotton market. Um, his family was his ancestors from Sweden. Uh, and he um, spearheaded the drainage of the rear of Algiers and um, uh, Implacaments Parish and Jefferson Parish were the rear of Gratna. Um, and uh, he was known as the Drainage King. Uh, and I mean, capital D, capital K. There was a parade for him, this amazing moment. The Saturday before Mardi Gras in 1915, 
there was this huge parade for the drainage king, and it went down St. Charles Avenue, down uh, Canal Street. There was a huge yacht waiting for them. They went across the river, up the Harvey Canal, and the whole goal was to have Woodrow Wilson in the White House press a button and through telephone connections activate the brand new Baldwin Wood pumps installed in the West Bank to, uh, to, right. to pull down the waters there. And it all worked perfectly. The, the, the uh, pump started up and within just a couple of hours, the West Bank achieved what, uh, what took Holland centuries. The only thing that didn't quite work was Woodrow Wilson. There was a delay in the communications. It was a Saturday. Uh, he got bored. He went out to play a league of golf. So some unnamed aide in the Oval <laughs> Office pressed the button to drain the West Bank of New Orleans. Well, let's talk about um, A. Baldwin Wood, because uh, we have, I guess, a lot to be grateful for, but ultimately we're sort of now paying the price in terms of what the draining the swamps is doing for us these days. But ultimately, yes, yeah, set that up. And of course, how renowned remarkable, he became. Remarkable young man, all of 20 years old when he graduates from from Tulane in their new building on the new campus. Uh, this is 1899, and he goes straight to work for the brand new, what's about to be renamed as the New Orleans Sewage and Water Board, and um, works there for 57 years. He could have made a fortune all over the world. Uh, he had all these patents. He never charged the city of New Orleans or the board for the use of his patents. The pumps are still in place so it's today. it's called a screw pump? A screw pump, <clears throat> uh, and, uh, which, which uh, as opposed to these older pumps that worked on vertical displacement, which sloppily pulled up the water and just spilled it out. These are impellers that suck up the water, uh, and everything's above grade, so you don't have to go down there. Uh, and with remarkable efficiency, 10 to 20 times more efficient, jettisoned the water out on the other side. And he also invented all these ancillary uh, uh, inventions where if you look at any one of the bigger pumping stations, they have these, these, these grids and these rakes that pull the debris out so they don't get clogged in them. He invented those. Um, and so what he did now, a lot of people give him credit for the draining of New Orleans, but do keep in mind that he was basically a child when the design, the system that we have today was designed. Mm. It was designed in 1893, so he would have been 14 years old. Uh, and um, it's, 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 it's executed starting in 1895, 1898, and then it's actually built in in the early 1900s. What he did, by the time he's doing these inventions, it's like 1907 into 1914. What he does is making the existing system that much more efficient. More efficient, I see. Um, I, I, the, the term I've heard you use in the past, which I'm so intrigued by, in the whole concept of close but not too close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about yeah, what that and means. Th there's really no word in geography for that. Um, close but not too close. Uh, <laughs> not my, uh, my I, I, not I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you some <laughs> examples. Um, why did West Bank? Why did the West Bank get all this industry that wasn't going to the East Bank? Um, it was close enough to this large labor pool, which could take ferries back and forth and did all the time, and they could also live on the West Bank. But it, so it was close enough to benefit from this major metropolis, but not so close that it would uh, raise all the land values compete for other uses of the land and have maritime everyday cargo loading and unloading affecting the West Bank and competing for space. Here's another example. Why do we have all the cemeteries and the fairgrounds along the Metairie Gentilly Ridge? You have the elevated topography there. It was just close enough to the city to have that clientele, right? Families with deceased loved ones, people wanting to go out to see races and fairgrounds, but it wasn't so close that the prices for the land would be high. And so there's that sweet spot where you're close enough to benefit from the city, but far enough that you have just the right real estate conditions. And, it, you know, for folks who may not be um, aware of this, that what is now Metairie Cemetery was originally the be, site of, 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 of a, a racetrack. Of, of a a racetrack, track, exactly. You know? exactly. And, and if, you, if you're if you traveling around there, if you have loved ones there, you know that you're, you're making going this. In an oval. Uh, you're going in an oval. No, you so, look at a satellite image and you could see the concentric yeah. rings. Right? Um, speaking of close but not too close, too, I know that there was a famous abattoir. There were the... Uh, 
and, and it, that is the prettiest word for something that's not too pretty, slaughterhouses, right? Animal slaughterhouses. And um, you didn't want those uh, too close, but right. uh, initially there's one in Jefferson, what we call Jefferson City today, along yeah. Jefferson Uptown. Avenue now, and, you know, and yeah. the river. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was also one, though, um, off Desire Street, and you know, I guess it would be Maroney Bywater. Arabi. In Araby. In Araby, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. But uh, the, the abattoirs, butchers, had the right, and this, they very adamantly defended this, mm -hmm. to have um, their butcher shops all over town. Mm -hmm. So they are driving live cattle through. They're slaughtering. There's awful and, and blood and guts mm -hmm. everywhere. And so this became a point of contention right after the Civil War. So neighbors were protesting. And so what they did was that the state created this slaughterhouse and concentrated them, mm -hmm. and there was a bitter legal dispute that went all the way to the Supreme Court known mm. as the slaughterhouse cases. Mm -hmm. Wow, we. Well, I hate to close on that, but that is fascinating <laughs> to say the least. But before we conclude, though, for further information uh, about Richard and his numerous books, you can go to Rich Campanella. Dot com. On his site are many articles pertaining to the New Orleans cityscape and history. Free! You can access them, which is very, very generous of you. And, um, and also lots of information about your books. Uh, are you working on a new one now? Or a, always a settlement working? geography for the entire state of Louisiana, city Ooh. by city, town by town. Pretty ambitious, sir, <laughs> to say the least. But um, it is such a pleasure, and I've learned so much uh, by your dedication to, uh, you know, to two decades here in New Orleans. You're originally from Brooklyn, but you are more Orleanian than most Orleanians, aren't you? I'll leave that for others to judge. <laughs> I know enough not to make that call myself. <laughs> thank you so much, Richard. It's thank a pleasure, you, and thank you for all your work. Oh, my, our pleasure. You've been so much help to all of that for so many years. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Programming on WYES is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. Public television is our passion. With so much content that WYES broadcasts and presents online, we are quite entertained and highly informed. Please join us in supporting WYES. The American Italian Cultural Center and Museum on South Peters in New Orleans offers event venue space, Italian language classes, dual citizenship and translation services, seminars, genealogy, and trips to Italy. Ciao, AmericanItalianCulturalCenter.com. This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area.